your brain on alcohol. What's going on in a drinker's brain? Well, today, guys, we're going to be diving deep into the scientific literature on how alcohol affects our brain, both short term and long term. Now, I've linked to all of the scientific publications and other resources that we used while researching the video in the description below. And just before we get into the video, if you want to get access to a free video training showing you how to control your drinking using first principles thinking, then make sure to click the link in the description. There'll be a free training video that explains some of the mistakes that people make when trying to stop drinking and the two phases of becoming sober clear. So if you want to learn how to control your drinking without AA and willpower and rehab and therapy, click the link in the description. Now back to the video. So when we talk about alcohol in your brain, we're talking about two different timeframes. First, the short term or acute phase of alcohol intoxication. What happens to your brain when you're tipsy or drunk? These are effects that are reversed when you sober up. But then there's also the long term effects, the permanent or semi permanent brain damage. That's when all the years of drinking add up and take a toll on your brain. This kind of damage leads to changes that are always there whether you're drunk or sober. And sadly, you might not even have had a drink for years, but the damage is still there. We'll look at this in the second part of the video. But first, the acute effects of alcohol, your brain after a few drinks. So let's first look at your brain when you're drunk. When we talk about alcohol addiction, we focus on the health problems, typically the things like the damage that it does to your liver or how it raises your blood pressure and so on. But there's also the social cost which is a result of altered brain function whilst on alcohol. Now, just to give you an idea of how destructive it is to the social fabric, in the US, alcohol is involved in approximately half of the murders committed each year. So approximately one out of two murders, the perpetrator had been drinking before or during the act. Alcohol is also heavily involved in the statistics of stabbings, domestic violence, child abuse, you name it. When all is said and done, alcohol related crime costs the US economy double the amount than all other drugs combined. Not bad for a legal drug that you can purchase in broad daylight in front of children from any supermarket. Now, according to the US Department of Transportation, alcohol is involved in one third of all traffic crash fatalities. And researchers have long known that alcohol is also involved in poor decision making. In plain English, it makes you do stupid things. Almost a quarter of women who turn up at an abortion clinic admit that they were binge drinking the month that they fell pregnant. So you're starting to get the picture here. Now to make sense of all of these disparate phenomena, of why alcohol makes you do all of these violent and, and stupid things, scientists have come up with the concept of alcohol myopia. So let's break that down. So according to the alcohol myopia model, the key feature of alcohol intoxication is that it narrows your attention. This is what we mean by myopia or short sightedness, that you basically can't see past what's directly in front of you. Alcohol intoxication destroys your ability to engage in an effortful controlled thought process. As a result, you allocate whatever attention that you have left to the most salient, immediately and easy to process cues. In other words, all your attention is focused on what's directly in front of you. This explains the various bizarre, stupid and sometimes violent things that people do when they're drunk. Take for example, risky sex. When somebody is drunk, they can't see past their sexual arousal. All their common sense can go out of the window and then they do something that they might end up regretting the next day or further down the line. Drunk driving is another example. When people are drunk, they focus all their attention, well, whatever is left of it, in the immediate rewards of driving. They think, you know, they'll get home quickly. They, they won't have to pay for a taxi or they won't have to come looking for their car the following day. It's all short term thinking. Any thought or stimulus that would normally stop you from doing something so dangerous is too far away in the background to even think about processing. And then of course, there's aggression. Why does alcohol make us so aggressive, so out of control? It makes people so violent. Again, it's the fact that all of your attention is focused on the most salient threatening aspects of the situation. For example, all you can see is the person that you don't like. They're right there in front of you. You might see the way that they're looking at you, what they're saying and how you're feeling towards them in the moment. All the less salient, less conspicuous cues that normally would hold you back. You don't have access to them at that moment. You can't process them. What will happen the next day, the long term consequences, the damage to your reputation, none of that ends up factoring in. And then you let go of your mouth, 
or your fists or whatever else it might be. Now, the concept of alcohol myopia also helps us understand why most people don't like to drink alone. If you're sitting at home all alone without any other stimulus to distract you, it's easy for your problems to come to the foreground. Rather than a relief, alcohol makes you even more depressed. So more often than not, drinkers will want to combine alcohol with something else, a salient event that alcohol will magnify even further. And then all of the problems, all of the worries, they just recede to the background. A social event, a night out, a football game, whatever. Then when you become more heavily addicted and start drinking on your own, alcohol ends up causing you the exact opposite effect. Rather than it being some kind of relief, it makes you even more depressed. It magnifies your problems even more, leaving us, sadly, with only one option, to drink even more. Now, obviously, there are many more ways in which being drunk affects your brain, aside from the myopia effect. Overall, scientists class alcohol as a central nervous system depressant. It lowers your system's overall activity, especially at higher levels. It does this by mimicking the actions of a neurotransmitter that your body naturally produces, called GABA. GABA is primarily an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It suppresses the action of neural tissues in your brain. It's involved in the regulation of anxiety, fear, and stress. Other drugs that mimic GABA are benzodiazepines like Valium and Xanax, as well as barbiturates, which is why you get many of the same effects from all of these drugs. Drowsiness, sleepiness, lowered anxiety, and of course, impaired performance. When you're drunk, your performance diminishes across the board. Your reaction time increases, your working memory plummets, your motor activity is reduced, your coordination suffers, pretty much everything is affected. And of course, your executive functioning is smashed to bits. By executive functioning, psychologists and neuroscientists refer to your ability to plan, initiate, and adapt goal-directed behavior, which is why when you're drunk, you basically can't do much. So we covered some of the changes that take place in your brain and behavior when you're drunk. We've looked at the short term. You sober up, these effects go away. So your attention is restored, you regain your reaction time, you regain your motor skills, your short term memory and everything else. However, as I mentioned earlier, over time, as the lifetime number of drinks piles up, some of the effects of alcohol become irreversible. There is only so much abuse that your brain can take before the damage is permanent. And eventually, circuits in your brain start to give out. Now, before we get into this, I want to clarify that this is not a scare tactic. None of what I'm going to say is meant to scare you. The purpose is education. You're gonna spend your whole life being bombarded with positive messages about alcohol. That's either directly through advertisements that glamorize drinks, or with news stories telling you how good certain drinks are for your heart, or even indirectly through glamorized depictions of drinking in television, in movies, celebrity magazines, and so on. Now, I think it's only fair that you get to hear the other side for a change, what alcohol really does to your brain over the long term, and that's as per the best scientific research currently available. So let's get into that side of things. The first thing that we're gonna break down is brain shrinkage and atrophy. Now, the first thing to understand is that alcohol is a neurotoxin. This means that it's toxic to the cells of the central and peripheral nervous system, and the effects are dose dependent. The more that you ingest, the higher the toxicity levels to your brain. Over time, heavy drinking brings about structural changes to the brain. That means changes that you can easily see on a macroscopic level without any magnification, either with a CT scan or an MRI. Researchers have found that 23% of heavy drinkers have a reduced frontal cortex, basically the front part of the brain. Another part of the brain that is often diminished is the hippocampus. This is a structure deep inside our brain that's involved in memory formation. Not just regular autobiographical memories, but also spatial memory, as in memory linked to roots, pathways, and locations. The hippocampus is closely linked to another brain structure that shrinks over time in many heavy drinkers the amygdala. This is involved in the regulation of emotions, threats, and the so-called flight or fight syndrome. Other brain structures that gradually atrophy after years of drinking include the cerebellum, the corpus callosum, the mammillary bodies, and more. These are all changes that you can see without any magnification. This is just with a regular imaging like, you know, a CT scan or an MRI. Now, in 1982, a group of doctors at a hospital in Oslo looked at the autopsy records going back 20 years. They found records for 545 male 
alcoholics. They compared these to the records of 586 matched men who did not drink and served as controls. They found a highly statistically significant difference between the brain weight of the two groups. The control group's brain were on average 31 grams heavier. That's slightly more than an ounce. When you translate that in terms of brain cells, consider that a healthy brain contains on average of 85 to 90 billion brain cells, or neurons as they're called meaning that those 31 grams work out to around 2 billion neurons less. That's billion with a B. 2 billion brain cells that alcohol will fry over the years. Well, the good news is, is that after a few months of stopping drinking, this reduction in brain mass actually starts to reverse. This is because the remaining neurons increase in size and they also increase their nerve endings. The brain cells that have died, however, are gone forever. They do never come back. Now, as you might have guessed, it's not possible to lose all those brain cells and still fire on all cylinders. And because the atrophy is widespread, you would expect to see significant cognitive decline and deficits across a wide range of domains. And this is exactly what you see. A 2017 review looked at the published research on the relation between long-term and heavy drinking and cognitive functioning. Here are the main findings. Executive functioning is heavily comprised in long-term heavy drinkers. This is evident in laboratory tasks that test for such things as working memory, attention, response inhibition, problem solving, deduction of rules, and more. These people also have difficulty with visual motor tracking skills, as well as memory, both about past events and remembering to do things in the future. They also have deficits in social cognition, that is the ability to understand and process social interactions. This includes difficulty processing humor and irony, as well as identifying certain emotions or experiencing empathy. Now, the good news is that just as with brain size, these declines are reversible after cessation of alcohol, at least in most drinkers and to varying degrees. So some drinkers who stop will make more of a recovery than others. And we don't yet understand what accounts for these differences in recovery. Now, in many cases, the brain gives out completely. According to researchers, up to one out of every five dementias in the general population is actually linked to alcohol. So first of all, you have alcohol-induced dementia. This is caused by the direct neurotoxicity of alcohol. In severe drinkers, this can occur as young as 30 years old, but this is rare. You typically see its onset between 50 to 70 years, and its severity is directly linked to how much alcohol the person has consumed over their lifetime. Now, Korsakoff syndrome is a special condition with characteristics very similar to dementia, such as confusion, disorientation, severe memory deficits, including the inability to form new memories. Eye movement is disturbed, muscles are weak, and overall coordination is poor. The cause of Korsakoff syndrome is a vitamin B1 deficiency. This vitamin is also known as theamine. You see, alcohol interferes with the body's ability to absorb theamine. It does this in various ways, which we're not going to go into now. But the point is, when you're theamine decision, your whole body is affected, and the brain especially so. This is because the brain needs a lot of energy, and theamine is crucial in helping your brain convert sugar to energy. Without enough theamine, the brain can't function properly. Now, if this isn't treated in time, then the damage is irreversible. Anyway, guys, all links to all studies are in the description below. And if you want to get that free video training, make sure to click the link in the description. Have a great day.